home on University Avenue has long anchored its historic neighborhood. Known as the Marini Home, it is a well-known Los Altos landmark. Hello, I'm Judy Johnson, your host for the Los Altos History Show. Tonight's guest is no stranger to our show, since she regularly is the host on our show, but tonight we're turning the tables, and we have with us Nan Geshke, who's going to be answering questions instead of asking them. Welcome, Nan, to the History Show. Oh, well, thanks for having me. It's fun me. to have you here as <laughs> the feels, guest instead of the host. It feels funny to be in this position. I play the re producer role and, and the host role, but now I get to be the guest, so this should be fun. Well, we're looking forward to hearing all about what you have to share with us tonight. Nan is the current owner of a home on University and wants to share with us the, the view and the viewers what she has been able to research uh, this home uh, was, is the Marini home, and she and her husband, Chuck, uh, purchased it about two years ago. And uh, we're really anxious to hear all that she has to share with us about the interesting background of the owner. Uh, we understand the home was built in 1926, Nan. It was built in 1926, and it was built by a man by the name of Frank Marini, uh, who built the home when he was, uh, he started building it when he was 63 years old. Oh my goodness. So he was, you know, he was, you know, not elderly, but he was older, you know, especially mm -hmm. for 1926 to be starting a project like that. All right. But uh, he had a fascinating, actually very fascinating life and he he uh, he was born in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco of Italian uh, American uh, Im immigrant family. Um, his father actually came here via um, Buenos Aires. Uh, for the gold rush, and he didn't oh. make any money in gold, uh, but settled in San Francisco, and that's where Frank was born. And he was the first of 11 children. Oh my goodness. And of those 11 Good children, family. none of them married. So there are no heirs to the uh, Marini name, no heirs to their estate at all. So it's been an interesting legacy. Uh, the, uh, the home built in 26 was built as a summer place, as, there, oh. as it, oh, many places in Los mm -hmm. Altos were. Uh, and, and, and the Marinis actually didn't use, he and his four sisters actually lived uh, there uh, on, and used it as a summer place until the 1940s. And then they moved down here permanently. Um, but uh, he really did have a fascinating, fascinating life. I understand you said he is uh, quite involved with the politics and uh, also social life there in, in San Francisco. What, he, what were some of his uh, interests and involvement there he, in San Francisco? He, he was. At the age of 15, he started uh, his, his, poli his political career. Um, and oh, at such you a know, young age. He was. And uh, he was very active in Republican politics. Um, uh, really throughout his lifetime. In fact, he was, uh, he was asked to run for the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, but he, he did decline. Uh, but he, he, he knew a lot of the politicians, and he was very well known in San Francisco. He was um, educated as, a, as a, uh, an accountant. He graduated from Heald uh, Business College, oh. uh, and mm -hmm. he had a, very, a variety of jobs in his young life, like some of us do. <laughs> uh, he worked um, in a lot of um, uh, clerical jobs, uh, and he worked for the post office at one point, and also kept books for a funeral home by the name of uh, Valente and Godot and Company. And he kept books for them for years. And then uh, in, I think, uh, 1897, bought out Godot and became the managing partner of uh, Valente Marini and Company. Wow. And there were many funeral homes in San Francisco. There just weren't one. So it was know very the prosperous. The business was such a prosperous business. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was. It was a good business, mm -hmm. but where he really made his money was that he was one of the early investors in the Bank of Italy, oh. which became the Bank of Calif uh, Bank of America, and of course that that's where his wealth came. Oh, I see. Um, but he also was a native son of the Golden West. He served as president of that organization mm -hmm. for two terms and was their treasurer for 60 years. And he was also very, uh, very active in Italian American activities and sponsored many, um, many m immigrants and, you know, helped them become citizens. So he was, he was very well beloved. Well, besides being a wealthy man, I understand he also shared his wealth and was known as a, quite a philanthropist. 
Um, he was. He was. Uh, I, by one one of the readings I had uh, that, I, that I, I've been able to get a hold of, uh, estimate, estimated that he um, gave away maybe a half a million dollars in his lifetime. And, and that for, was a lot of money at yeah, that time. It was a lot of money. Uh, it was quite a bit of money. And he, he didn't give particularly huge amounts, but he, what he did give, mm -hmm. he, he gave, I think, very wisely. And the Marini name actually still lives on um, in Los Altos, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But also in San Francisco, there's a park named after Frank uh, in, um, in North Beach. It's actually right across the, the uh, street from the Washington Square Bar and Grill. Oh. If there's a tiny little sliver of land and there's a bus to Frank Marini there, right across from St. Peter's and Paul's Church. Um, who he, I, I, actually, he gave money to the church uh, for the building of a playground. I think he gave fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But um, in Los Altos, he uh, donated sixty-five thousand dollars in the early '40s to build St. Nicholas Church. Oh, and it was actually during the war, and mm -hmm. they didn't even know if they could even build the church. But the bishop approved the site. And what he, year was that? It was 1941, I think, that oh, he actually mm -hmm. bought the property to build St. Nicholas Church. Um, and he did get permission from the bishop. I heard that he had, uh, one of the stories was that he called the bishop up, up, up one day and said, I have a church, please send me a priest. <laughs> but I, I've done further research, and actually he did get the bishop's permission and, to build this church. And there actually was a group of ladies in, in, the, in Los Altos who were kind of lobbying. I can imagine at that time there were, weren't as many parishioners that maybe, you know, you think of it uh, in forty enough for one parish maybe right. in Los Altos. And the church really still on, only holds 200 people so you know mm -hmm. you can sort of you can sort of garner Very from intimate. that information mm -hmm. that there weren't that all that many people who, would, mm -hmm. who were going to be using the church but of course it's far outgrown it, itself uh, now since there are a lot more people who who attend but uh, he not only uh, donated uh, the money for that church to be built, but also some of the statuary and stained glass mm -hmm. windows in the church. Oh, yeah. He uh, also do donated an apartment building at, that was built at El Retiro, and the and their actual meeting hall at El Retiro is named after him. It's called Marini Hall. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and as I said, there's uh, there's scholarships in uh, in his name at the University of San Francisco still to this day. So uh, his legacy lives on, and money of his was must have been set up in trust. Now the interesting part about the home was that um, because there were no heirs, his his youngest sister lived until she was 90 years old. He lived until he was 92. He died in, in 1952. Oh, okay. Uh, and almost all of his sisters and brothers lived to be that age. His youngest sister died in 1969, and then the, the house was, was transferred to the Sisters of Sacred Heart, who kept it as a summer place I see. for a couple of years, and then decided that they couldn't really maintain it very easily. It, they were too far away from it, mm -hmm. and, you know, to really maintain it well. So they sold it to uh, Dr. Um, Jerome T uh, Tossi and his family. Oh. And that family uh, lived there for 25 years until they sold it to us. So oh. there really haven't been all that many owners of no. the home. And that's been a wonderful legacy for the home because um, so many of, of, of its parts are original. And I'm just dying to hear more about the house itself. Um, you've uh, been renovating it, I understand. What are some of the features of the home? I, I know being built in 1926, it, it's uh, kind of a period home. What are, what are some of the features well, that you're very fond of? Well, it was built in the mid-20s, and uh, again, I, I sort of go back to the fact that, you know, in the 20s, things were changing quite mm -hmm. a lot, but this man was 63 years old when he built the home, so it, he was not sort of on the cutting edge of, of architecture, so it is more classic in feeling. And so it was built along classical lines. Uh, it's a, a large kind of four square, and it, it has a lot of features that are classic. 
Um, it has yeah. Palladian windows, which are its signature. And, and what are Palladian windows? Well, you they're, describe uh, they're, those? They're, uh, they're windows that have an arched top. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And they're called Palladian. Um, and they also, there's also some stone work and some balcony work on the home that is very reminiscent of a more classical age. And some of the interior features that we'll be able to point out when we take you on location oh, yeah, um, will we'll, we'll kind of tie in this idea of, of neoclassic influences that, that really dominate the home. It has a red tile roof, mm -hmm. so it uh, does have some Mediterranean influence. Is that influence the original too. tile that was there no, in 1926, it, or has it been changed and It's been re-roofed. Uh -huh. It has been re-roofed, and we didn't do it, but the former owners oh, okay. did. And it's, it, but it was done exactly as it had been, so it, it's a duplicate of what the original tile roof looked like. So actually, very little about this Marini home has changed, um, which was one of the things, one of the really charming um, aspects of this home, I think, that's really sort of uh, kind of grabbed our attention. Is um, it considered a historical uh, landmark now? It is on the inventory of historic places, but mm. it's not a landmark. It's mm. probably going to become a landmark, and one of the reasons it will become a landmark is not so much its age, it's 70 years old, which mm -hmm. is... You know, it's it's an old house. You know, by our California standards, right? <laughs> but it's not real, not as old as some of the homes in town. Um, but it it has not changed very. It hasn't changed at all. The exterior of it, it has not changed. And we made one minor change in the exterior. We ex we exchanged a door for a window oh, in the rear of the home, and uh -huh. it's it's really not noticeable at all. And so, for this reason, it will probably be designated. And a lot of the interior features, which really doesn't have anything to do with um, with having it designated. Mm -hmm. um, haven't changed either. The plaster finish on the foyer, the, a lot of the uh, light fixtures were original to the house, and, and uh, the sisters and uh, Jerry and Tammy Tossey kept those and beautifully, and we've, we've been able to incorporate them into our decorating scheme as well. And How so wonderful. It's really, it's really been a pleasure, and it's been a lot of fun. It to must have a very special feel with all the classical architecture and, and uh, design to the home. It, it really does, and it really gives you a, a great appreciation for how much thought went into the home, obviously by uh, Frank Marini and his sisters. Um, and, and also the architect, Mr. Noel, mm -hmm. um, whom uh, we just found out about. And I'd like to be able to find out more about him. I know he's built some other homes, or did build some other homes around Stanford University and in the city. And we believe he, he built St. Nicholas Church as well. So I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, that I can find out more about him as time goes on. Well, we're really tickled to hear all about your home, and we're really anxious to, to go out and see it on location. Uh, Nan and uh, Chris Johnson, one of our crew uh, members, uh, have some location footage that they would like to share with the viewers, and the show is in two parts, so we want you to tune in next week for the continuation of the tour. And for now, we want to thank Nan so much for being with us on History Show, and stay tuned for the first part of the tour of the Marini home. Thank you. Thanks, Nan. Yeah, that was thanks. Really fun.
The 220 residence is flanked by three gates. Two of them are original to the home, the one on University Avenue that we see here. There's another on Brook Road and another, uh, a new one uh, that's going to be put in on Al Altos Road. The detail on, on, the, on the ironwork is very elaborate. Uh, we see a fleur-de-lis detail as well as a beautiful rosette, which is actually um, detailed in, in the home as well. I believe that the ironwork was probably done by the same iron fabricator because there are too many uh, similarities both on the outside of the home and on the interior. The stonework that we have added to the home um, is, includes the coping along the driveway as well as all the stone walls and the fountain area. We couldn't find the Carmel stone, which is the stone which, which was used on the original gates, but we did find a stone that was similar called Santa Maria stone, and we added it to the property when we re-landscaped it. And we, we feel that it, it's similar enough uh, to carry through what this very strong architectural statement of stone was to this home in the 20s. There are many architectural features to the exterior of this home which make it uh, very enduring and endearing. Uh, one of them is the palladium style windows and doors as well as a uh, total of four uh, balconies that are that are surrounded with uh, a beautiful wrought iron railing. And we've carried this wrought iron, wrought iron railing into other areas of the home and landscaping as we've continued the project. As you can see, this is a, a, a good uh, a good view of of one of the balconies, which is actually on the. Uh, second floor mezzanine level. We've added uh, several uh, structures to the property since we purchased it and one of those structures is a carport and that's completely finished. As you can see we tried to uh, be sensitive to the architecture of the home by using the same roofing material, red tile, and we used stucco and the same awning material that we, found, we find on the home. Uh, the only I guess difference would be the addition of the columns and we did this to uh, kind of camouflage the fact that it is a carport and it does overlook uh, a rose garden which um, uh, is in its immature stages right now but we hope and have great high hopes that uh, we'll get some lovely blooms later on this spring. We're standing in front of the residence at 220 right now. We've just come through the gates and I want to talk a little bit about what we're standing in front of. The facade of the building is been, has been described as a classic revival. And what was going on in the 20s was that people were very influenced by, for example, Greek and Roman architecture. And for example, this building has a lot of influences from a lot of different architectures. And so it's kind of a, a, a conglomeration of those although it works very well. And some of the classic elements include the, the balustrades, of course, in front, and the, and, the, and the plaster urns, as well as the Palladian windows, and some of the light fixtures. These two, for example, were original to the house, and they always were in this position. The light fixture at, on, in front of the door, it was original to the home, and we believe made by that same iron fabricator, but it's been uh, wired for external use now so that it can withstand the elements. The glass work is, uh, is the work of Gordon Heather of, of the Napa Valley uh, Architectural Glass Company. Uh, he's done a, a wonderful job in recreating a door uh, to look like what originally was here. Actually, there was a, a plain door with a beveled edge and then a metal grate that went over it. And what we did was try to reproduce that entirely in glass. And he's used uh, a, a lot of glasses that were popular in the 20s. So this design could have easily been one that could have been designed then. 
We added this fountain area in front of the home, and we found the fountain actually in Atlanta, Georgia this past summer, and it's a replica of a, an, an old French mold uh, cherub. It's a, it's a really classic design, although the, the fountain itself is not antique. It would have been one that would have been uh, probably used in the 20s if it had been here originally. Again, we added the stonework and the limestone uh, paving both to this, the fountain area and to the front step area. So that is a, a new addition. The circular driveway was here and it and we did just follow the contours of it we thought we would share with you some uh, early video of the home as it was under construction as you can see it uh, it underwent a, a lot of work you can see some of the materials in the back of the home as well as uh, some of the early early uh, construction here's a a a stone cutter building the lower terrace. Here is the underpinning for the reflection pond. And uh, this is the uh, lower terrace. Uh, this was quite extensive. Uh, you can see the footbridge beyond it. And now this is the underpinning of the fountain area that we just had talked about. The bridge uh, actually went through quite a metamorphosis. Uh, there were, uh, there were um, arches on it at one point, and we eliminated those. This is the staircase uh, down into the lower garden, as well as the footbridge without the arch. You make mistakes, <laughs> we find. The, the steel pillars uh, uh, underneath the columns of the carport and uh, the final grading of the circular uh, driveway. You can see some of the construction trucks there, and here's the finishing of that driveway in the front of the home. And now for some of the finished pictures, uh, this is the front, the side of the home. Uh, you can see some of the wrought iron work on the balconies and staircases and the wonderful oaks that are flank each side of the home, as well as the balustrade and urns that we talked about, and some of the, the landscaping that we added. Again, the Palladium windows that are the signature of this home. And the finished staircase down into the lower garden, as well as some of the stonework that we talked about. The finished carport. There are there it is, complete with, with the SUV. And then this is the colonnade in the back garden that uh, kind of brings all of the architecture together. And this is a good shot of the rear of the home, as well as uh, the lower area that has a pool now, and a pool house, as well as a gazebo area. We added a lot of stone to the buildings in the back to add a lot of age. This is again another one of the wonderful oaks, the colonnade, and a great shot of, of the home through the colonnade. And again, the gazebo and the stairs into the gazebo and up the stairs and into the kitchen area, which, is, which has a barbecue and plenty of room for seating. And this is the finished reflection pond, complete with a waterfall. You can see that it goes up to the side of the building. And you can see some of the stonework, the finished stonework as well as some of the mature trees that were on the property. And again, that uh, Santa Maria stone that we talked about. And we're back to the front of the home. So I hope you have enjoyed our exterior tour today and that you join us the next time for an interior tour of 220 University.